going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to my shop. And tonight, we have Matt Cremona with us, and uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. So, um, <laughs> for, yeah, for those of you who don't know, this guy over here is Matt Cremona, and uh, he is actually one of the big reasons why I am on YouTube. So I wanted to uh, bring him on because the two of us will have a little bit uh, too much fun. So, say hi, Matt. I'm good. Hello, good morning. Evening, whatever you so are. It was a good morning. If you guys can tell us uh, how is the sound, because the sound check I did beforehand, um, apparently I was having some issues. But uh, um, if you click uh, announcements, we have the chisel test coming. Um, so I've been working on that very, very heavily. Um, so we're going to have another 19 chisels to add to the previous test. So we will have a total of, uh, I think it's 37 chisels total that have been all compared and tested. So that will hopefully be coming out a little before Thanksgiving, but who knows? We will find out. Um, that probably means before the new year. <laughs> but Sometime, for those whenever. who have been interested, it'll, it will be coming. Um, so yeah, we have uh, Matt Cremona here with us tonight. Uh, Matt, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Oh, you, you warned me about this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Matt. I do uh, videos about... I guess the full spectrum of woodworking all the way from the tree to your, your finished piece. I do a lot of um, urban logging, which is kind of going into like people's yards and uh, picking up trees that are otherwise discarded, sawing them into uh, lumber and then drying and eventually building things uh, out of those trees that would otherwise be discarded in a landfill. Big trees too, big Big trees. The bigger, the better. <laughs> he, he likes big crotch. <laughs> <laughs> and he cannot let, I'm sorry, yeah, he couldn't yes. let it go. <laughs> yeah, uh, most of my big lumber comes from Matt's stash. So the dining room table, the yeah. desks, the, the chair stock. Um, he is my enabler, so. Uh... <laughs> I'm happy to be that guy. <laughs> So the, uh, the big question for me, um, for you, is uh, why do you do what you do? Um, what, is the, what is the thing that drives you? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't really have a, a, like a good, good answer for that, other than I just really enjoy it. And for some reason, I'm passionate about what I do. I, 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 don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you I guess. You seem to um, be willing to try different things in different ways and uh, um, go where your passions take you, as opposed to just being in a pigeonhole of dovetails. Yeah, I don't. I don't like to stay like still for too long. I guess so. If I can challenge myself to do some new thing, like in the shop or outside of the shop, or some new kind of skill or some different way of doing things, I'm going to do that because uh, like repetition is something that I hate like to an extent because I do like a lot of things I do are kind of repetitive, but doing the same thing, or like building the same thing over and over again would just exhaust me. And I would have zero passion for that. So what, uh, what's your current project? We're adding an addition on our house. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that concrete working and I had, uh, uh bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, speaking of trying new things, there you go. <laughs> so let me ask you this. For this project, what was the new tool you had to get for it? A telehandler. A what was that? A telehandler. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's why that's one of the reasons I bought that machine was for this project. Cool. Uh, for those of you watching um, live, if you want to throw questions in the chat, we will throw those over to, uh, to Matt. Um, and if you are watching this recorded, look down in the description and I'll have timestamps to all the questions so you can jump to those into the video. And uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, if we don't get to them all, then um, oh well. <laughs> we'll keep yeah. Matt here until 1 a.m. <laughs> so, what questions we got, babe? All right. So let's see. SJ LaRue, this question's for Matt. Are you going to use your new bucket to wash down a fresh slice? Oh yes. It's it's a lot of bucket too. I think it's I think it's like two hundred and something gallons. 
Now, Somewhere you, around you, there? You should explain to Sarah what that means. I was like, I have no thing, clue like, what we're no talking what about. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got a bucket for my telehandler, and it's one and a quarter yards. I did the math to do the gallon conversion. I think it was like, it was 200 something gallons of water. So instead of using my little bucket with like one gallon in it, I can use this giant bucket that holds a couple hundred. For, and then the big, and I can I can drop it from forty two feet in the air. Oh, that sounds like something James would want to come play with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we like big toys. I could just see another channel spin off. Like, what can we drop out of the bucket? Dumping stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's always the the fun thing when you're um, when you're milling lumber. You never quite see the grain because it's all roughs on, but you throw water on it, and suddenly you can see the grain pop. Oh, it's incredible the difference it makes. Just even like it's one thing in person. The, the camera is even worse at oh, seeing yeah. it. So like you can't see it at all on camera, and then the water is like, oh, you can actually see what I'm talking about now. Oh, that's nice. And suddenly the crotch pops out. Yeah, suddenly, suddenly you got a crotch in your face. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Love, love making my wife cried. <laughs> okay, but you gotta remember, I'm a nurse. Like. <laughs> yes. There's some things that just are part of the job. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? <laughs> I wish I digress. She gets her ear back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired tonight. Apilicus. Uh, let's see. I'm assuming this question is for you, Matt. How long did it take him to get his bandsaw mill sourced and built? Also, if he uses a gantry to move heavier lumber, like the slab bench top he made a while back. I can answer the first, but I'm not sure what the second one's asking. Uh, the first question, uh, how long it take to get the, the saw like running, I guess, uh, about four months. Uh, I started in like mid August and then James came to visit me the first week of September. And then it was running December 22nd, I think, about four months, somewhere, somewhere in there. And that's one of those projects that's never actually done. Well, it's, it's working. It's still not done, <laughs> technically, but Yeah, when are you going to put hydraulics later, on it? I keep pushing that one down the road because I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just want to cut wood. <laughs> Yeah, where where do you come up with all of the big trees um, that you that you source? Uh, Just have a really good grapevine. Yeah, pretty much are all uh, yard trees. Um, so a lot of times now, I'm I, I guess I have enough popularity that people know who I am, so that things tend to come to me now. But a few years ago, it was a little more. I guess active searching. So I would spend a lot of time on Craigslist and just look for big logs in people's yards that they had to get rid of because they didn't want to, you know, pay for removal or they thought they're gonna do something with it and they didn't, and it's just still sitting there. It's not cut up into firewood lengths. There's a lot of that too, <laughs> but you know, once once you get through once you weed through that, then you can get these these big old logs that no one's touched. Big logs. Now, big did logs. you did you act, you moved all of your your lumber stacks, right? I did. Yep. Yeah, that that was a lot of movement. That's like, that's a lot. <laughs> I never want to move again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you it thought was, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, imagine um, our whole basement space completely filled floor to ceiling with lumber that's all two inch thick. That'd be the two and inch would be the thick like stuff. Two to three feet wide. Are you speaking to me specifically yeah, or that's the okay. how much lumber you moved. <laughs> I was like, I remember the stack I saw at your house. I can just imagine <laughs> That's right, you went there for when we got the, yeah. the, the, the desk. That was the table, yeah. wasn't it? Desks, yeah. Desks, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of wood there was a lot of wood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's next, baby? Let's see. So these are some very serious questions from Alex. Um, one, how does Matt feel about his presence on TikTok? 
and what would be his name of his kingdom? Like we have Knights of the White Oak. So how do you uh, feel about your presence on TikTok? How am I supposed to feel about it? Where am I, I have options of how I should feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even. I've tried to stay away from TikTok with everything I can, but I feel like I'm going to get pulled into it here soon. I mean, I like it as a, as a, I think as a platform, it's really great for creators like us because it enables us to, I, it's a different, it's obviously a different format of video because things are a lot more fast paced and it, it kind of forces you to kind of condense things into a very narrow format. At the same time, the platform allows for a lot more engagement with the community. So you can respond directly to someone's question with another video. So you can essentially create that video for that person. So you feel like, or so that, that person that's asking the question feels a little more involved in the creation process. Now, like here on YouTube, you can still, you can answer a question that someone asked as, as a video, but there it's like, okay, the, the comment comes up, it's tagged. You can go back and see where they asked it. So it's a little more intertwined. And you can also, if you want to uh, add something to someone else's video, you can uh, duet them. So you can have basically this side to side thing and you can talk about what that person's doing. If you'd want to do it in a different way, or you want to add something else in there, or you can take a piece of someone else's video and then add your own video on the end of it. So like context that someone else is doing and then explanation. So I think there's a little, there's some, there's some good features there that make it a good platform, but there's a lot of crap as far as content <laughs> for, for viewers and consumers. So I, I know I've been on it for, oh, I don't know, six or eight months now when the algorithm has finally like figured out who I am as a person and stopped showing me like dancing videos. <laughs> so I, I get to like see like things I actually like, like people in their shops working on things. Uh, for some reason, I like heavy equipment stuff, uh, cranes and transporting stuff. Uh, that's apparently a thing I like. So it's, it's fun in a sense, but it's definitely like a weird place. It's weird, very weird. Now I keep wanting to, to dive into it, but I, I, I still haven't gotten into um, shorts and stories on Instagram, which I feel as it has that similar, creating short videos is something I have never gotten into. Yeah, so the, Should do more the, the shorts feature on YouTube is kind of weird. Yeah. Because you're, you're publishing to your audience. So I have a lot of videos from my TikTok that would go, or would fit into that shorts platform, but they're essentially just trailers for full length YouTube videos. And I feel like that would just confuse people like way too much because it's literally the same video, but like here's the one minute version and here's the 20 minute version. It's like this, this is the same piece of content as far as the viewer over here. And I think they haven't really sold it well enough or figured it out well enough for the viewers yeah. here on YouTube to like kind of know what the heck is going on with these things. And the other, I guess, downside is I created a lot of content on TikTok, but TikTok allows you up to three minutes. So I have a lot of really good short form content that's like a minute 40 that is too long for a short. So I can't not publish it here. So... It's, it's an interesting new space, yeah. I guess. Well, isn't that like social media in general? It's just always there's a new thing to tackle and understand and dive into. <laughs> there is. That's, that's also the problem because it's always changing. I'm like, okay, now I got to change with it or yeah. that's it, I guess. What was the second half of that question, babe? What would be the name of his kingdom? <laughs> yeah, so for, you know... Um, here we have the Knights of the White Oak and the whole thing on the chat is like medieval themed and everyone has a different knighthood of, of uh, the, the Knight of Wood River and uh, um, okay. Yeah, well, so I, I, I know you like have a, a kingdom. I think our nickname for the property is Big Crotch Acres. So I don't know if that really works for kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's the neighboring kingdom. <laughs> The neighboring kingdom of Big Crotch. <laughs> <laughs> there's a good video in there somewhere. I was thinking there's a sweatshirt or something. That April took Fools me. is coming up, Matt. <laughs> Get Lindsay on that. She can make something. <laughs> What's next? All right. Let's see. Dennis Mika asks, does Matt have any antique tools? Hmm. Uh, I guess. I mean, how, 
how far back is an antique technically considered? Uh, you I got guess several good Stanleys. Are those technically antiques, or are they just vintage? Well, is there a difference? I, I think I think a lot of people think anything older than the person holding it is an antique. That's most things I'm holding. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a uh, compass plane. That's probably like my more frequently used vintage antique tool with the uh, you know the adjustable sole thing. I actually use this quite a bit. Really, it's one of those tools that you don't really think you're gonna need it, and then you, when you have it, you're like, "Yep." Where'd you last? I can use find it? all kinds of uses for this. Um, I have a few other like Stanleys, but. This is probably the only one that I actually use. Uh, what did you last use the compass plane on? Uh, the the serpentine chest. Oh, that's right. You're making that that uh, wavy front. Yeah, that that thing. You got lots of yeah. colors in that thing. Too many. <laughs> I I keep looking at uh, um, uh, Sarah's aunt has one in her that's a. Uh, uh, a three-dimensional wave and it kind of bubbles out in the front. Um, I'm trying to remember the French term for it. But it's, it's all covered in marquetry. Mm. And uh, I keep looking and thinking, one of these days I might try that. And then I think, you're crazy. Don't, don't even mess with that. <laughs> it's, it's a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you start off with this much wood and you end up with this much wood. <laughs> well, like everything is like a thing with it. It's like with like a, a flat front, Chest of drawers, it's like, yeah, okay, whatever, just cut your dividers and slam them in, you're done. Now it's like, okay, cut your dividers, then we're going to profile them, make them all pretty, and then you can finally put them in. Or the drawer fronts, so like, okay, just cut the drawer fronts to the size, put them in, you're done. No, 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 cut them to the size, put them in, make your serpentine, make it all pretty, and then you're done with that. And then you got to cut some angled dovetails instead of flat ones or square ones. It's like, a, it's a whole thing. <laughs> Uh, What's next? So I think this question can be for either. Um, Logan Logging On asks, what's a good angle for a homemade hand plane for the frog? A good angle for the frog? On a homemade hand plane. But do you have anything that's not 45, Matt? No. Other than, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have a, uh, a bevel up. I have one bevel up that I never use, yeah. I was going to say 45 is just a good standard. That's unless you want to do like a really high end figured smoothing plane, then you might want to go for a 50 or 55, but 45 is just the, it does everything. <laughs> why mess with perfection? <laughs> That's why I sell wedges for frogs now. There you for go. People who want to mess with perfection. <laughs> All right, so this question is for Matt. Um, Kenny and then Janet Horn asked, can you pan the camera and show the front of your tool cabinet? Tool cabinet? Yeah. Hang on. Oh, I won't be able to see because you guys have it like cropped. That's yeah, narrowed over. Let me see. Oh, no, I can't flip it from this one. I think that should be the front. Maybe. Hang on, I gotta go look and see what you guys can actually see. Yeah, when did you remake that one? Uh, what, two years ago? Was it two years ago, yeah. I think. Do you still have the old one? No, I gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I keep getting things. people asking me to make a tool cabinet, and it's like, why would I make a tool cabinet? I got the whole you got thing, a thing behind you. What do you need a tool cabinet for? Yeah. <laughs> It's actually kind of an interesting um, thing when you look into it is that um, tool cabinets and um, tool chests were either for the carpenter who traveled from worksite to worksite so he could take his tools with him easily, or there were multiple carpenters working in a single shop and they wanted to be able to lock their tools up. Right. Um, and uh, if you actually go to a, a few of the historical shops, you'll see that they have tool walls if there isn't a need to lock them up because it's just which makes sense it's easy but if you're in a power tool shop then there's dust everywhere or you can be like you and just leave it open yeah who cares let leave it open it's, it's a display wall cabinet <laughs> thing <laughs> essentially that's all it is 
with some like with extra walls essentially <laughs> that's all it is every now and then i see a picture of the studly tool chest and i think oh one of these days i'll do something like that and i think there's no I, way i could limit myself to that many tools <laughs> one of the one, every time i see a thing i'm like yeah this is nope i'm not that kind of person that's not me yeah <laughs> What's next, babe? Let's see. The poor man asked, hey, Matt, did you ever finish your secretary desk? Yep, I finished that. When was that? 2015? 16? 15? 15. Did you ever get the drawer bottom in it? I mean, I have them. I, I had them in my old shop. I moved them. <laughs> and I have them here somewhere in this shop. Or they're, maybe they're in the barn now. But they're just the bottom panels for the, some of the gallery drawers. I think three of them don't have bottoms. The drawers that are too high for anyone to use. No, they're right there in the desk area. Oh, the little ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to do um, a roll-top desk someday like that with the bureaus. I know my wife would enjoy that. but I love like, secretary desks. Where would I put it? No, yours is a... Um, what was the time frame on that one, the history? Uh, I started that one. I mean, like, is that like the, what, 1850s? Oh, yeah. That would be a mid, mid 1800s, yep. That's a nice one. What's next? So the next question I pulled out is from Dwayne, and all it says is, can you build a sailboat? <laughs> so whoever wants to take that one. The answer is yes. Okay, next question. Sure. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> no one put anything past have, James. Have you ever wanted to? A sailboat? Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I seriously thought about it. Um, when was this? Oh, it was when we went to Maker Central. Oh, okay. Um, in uh, 2018, 2019? 2019. What about? In London. There was a guy there who made a small... Um, like a, a twenty, a, a twelve foot long dinghy, all wood, wooden mast, really, really beautiful, and all out of uh, simple cedar clapboard. I thought I can do that. That looks like fun. And then I got back home and reality hit, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I wanted to make a canoe for a while. That's been on my my list for like oh, right, ten years. Can you finish Previously, I never had a, a, any room to actually make it or store it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I still, I guess I have room to make and store it now, but I don't have anywhere. I had to bring it somewhere to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had a friend in Pennsylvania that was making a, a cedar strip kayak. Um, a really long, beautiful, thin line kayak. And uh, he made it in his basement. And you go down there, and his basement turns twice on the way down. It's like, how in the world are you going to get this out of here? He says, I have a plan. Don't worry about it. Well, the day came, and he said, okay, um, I'm going to be taking it out of my house. Can you come over and help me for four or five hours to get it out of the house? And I'm like, why, why do we need four or five hours to move a kayak? <laughs> I get there and find out that he paid for his wife to go spend the night somewhere else. <laughs> And we moved all the furniture in the living room from one side to the other, and we peeled back the carpet. We pulled up the OSB subfloor. We removed one of the joists underneath the living room. So we had a 32-inch uh, slot. We brought it up through the joist out the front door, put the joist back in, put the OSB down, put the carpet back, put the furniture back, and his wife never knew how we got wait, it Wait, out. wait, wait, wait. Where did you do this? It was a, 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 um, one of the guys I worked with at uh, Sight and Sound. <laughs> Whose house did you do this to? His own house. <laughs> he, he wasn't going to tell his wife how he did it because, you know, she would have freaked out from it, but uh, he... And rightfully so. Tore the house apart <laughs> <laughs> to get the kayak out of the basement. But he's a, a smart kayak, man. Though. Smart, that's yeah. one way to do buy it. Buying all expense, yeah. you know, pay She came back, or... never knew the distance difference, and yeah. there's the kayak there now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're not allowed to start any other projects till the chairs are done. Yeah, no, I still have my. <laughs> here, I, I finished the one, and now I've got the rest of them sitting here. At least you're working on them. 
maybe. Yeah, I've got the, the rest of them sitting over here. Oh, jeez. <laughs> waiting to be finished. <laughs> well, you're almost done then. They're, they're all scraped. They're all taped. Uh, they're all ready to be finished. I just need to have uh, two days of shop time without any dust. Yeah. That I can hang them all up and cover the shop and all of these bits and pieces. Yeah, that's that's gonna be a lot of parts and hanging be around. Four everywhere. days of gluing, and I can glue two at a time. And, uh, so from the lesson you just learned, you can send Sarah and the kids and <laughs> someone to an all expense paid vacation, and you can have all the shop time you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long is your uh, your to do list of, of videos? The things you want to do. Things I want to do or things I've already shot that are not edited and released. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of two different lists. <laughs> I've got a crazy backlog of, of projects that I'm working on that are half done and uh, need to finish up. And yeah, I never give the, the time to actually get them all done. And then there's the list of videos that I have footage on my computer that just needs to be edited. And, uh... <laughs> I, I, yeah, I feel you. <laughs> I have I have a couple that I'm working on or that I need to finish from like, well, they, they don't take place here. <laughs> I've, I've got one that I shot four years ago. I was making a, um, a pentagonal bowl. So it's a five-sided bowl and all of the sides are splayed. Mm -hmm. And they're all of the splayed sides are through dovetailed into the other one. So each board has a pin on one end and a dovetail on the other. Okay. Um, sequentially around the five. And then there's an angled groove in the bottom for a bowl. And I got all the pieces cut. And um, I cut all the tails, one on each end, and then realized I cut them all wrong. <laughs> So I made the bowl a little smaller <laughs> and, and I have, it's still sitting there in there. One of these days I need to just pull it out and finish it. It's probably like, you know, four or five hours worth of work, but the footage will look really weird because the first half of it was done when the shop was flipped out over there and the second half will be done on this side. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'll be impressed if I ever see it. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> What's next, babe? Okay, so this next question is for Matt. So Clark42 asks, how much did that insane sawmill cost? Uh, <clears throat> I spent uh, eight and a half thousand on materials from mine. I had some stuff that a friend gave me that he had salvaged from the dumpster at work. Uh, that would be the linear bearings. And he also had the, uh, the motor I'm using that he took off an old buffer. So I got those as kind of freebies, which kind of, which helped uh, reduce the cost. I had a couple people build it before things got inflated with materials and they came in around 15,000 if they, well, they use all new stuff as well. Yeah. How many have you seen completed? Uh, I think I have seen six or seven and there's another I want to say eight that are in, in progress. <laughs> and then what's kind of weird about it is it, it seems like a lot of people that actually build it never tell me that they built it because I find out about all these completed saws or it's happened a couple of times now where I find out about a saw that's completed from someone else who didn't build it, but knows about it. And it's like, yeah, that guy over there built your saw. I'm like, Oh really? And I look it up, I find him, like, he bought the plans and just never told me, which I mean, it's fine. You don't, you don't have to tell me if you actually yeah. finished it, but I would be pretty ecstatic and be like, look what I did. Can you <laughs> believe this? <laughs> oh, I've, got a, I've got an interesting question for you. Um, what is the dream project? The, the thing that someday when you've got a lot of time and you really want to make something fun and special, what would it be? I don't know if it's going to be fun. It'd be fun in the beginning, but it won't be fun like partially through it. 
it would be like a Bombay chest of drawers, like a Bombay secretary desk, some 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 kind of Bombay thing. <laughs> Which, after experiencing this, I kind of know what I'm in for, but like, only I only know this much. I'm sure it's gonna be like this. <laughs> but that's that's the dream. Someday when the other projects aren't pressing. Well, someday when I forget about the pain of this. <laughs> yes. Then, then we'll go do that. <laughs> but that uh, the, the big cherry tree that I got out of Iowa is going to become that Bombay piece. Uh -huh. Or it'll be, it'll be enough for multiple Bombay pieces for the rest of my life. <laughs> because my first Bombay piece is probably going to be crap. So then maybe like eight years later, I'll try again. And then like another eight years later, I can do it again or something like that. Okay, for the people like me who don't know, what do you mean Bombay? So a, a Bombay chest is sort of like the serpentine chest. So if I turn my camera a hair, I can't even see. What do you guys see? Yeah, that looks flat, but it's actually wavy. Yeah, yeah, I'll pull a drawer out. <clears throat> uh, hang on. You can see that, right? Mm -hmm. Where am I going here? This way? This way. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> So this has got a uh, one-dimensional curve, so it curves across the, the front of the case. Bombay would have a curve across the front, also down like this. Hmm. So it's a compound curve, or It'd be basically taking that and putting someone really heavy on it, and it kind of puffs out in the middle. <laughs> yeah, and it's like flat, and then it bulges out and comes back in again. So know. all your... All your drawers, all the drawnery is going to be dovetails. They'll be angled and splayed. So it's <laughs> compound joinery. So when Which will this be one be done? When will this set of drawers be done? Um, when I have time. <laughs> <laughs> when the addition is done on the house? Uh, I have a few little, I got just a few small things to do still. I got to make the drawer bottoms and the backboards and then install the, uh, the hardware, which showed up not too long ago. So I got, it's the same hardware as the high boy. Nice. They got to throw that on. So got a little, it's an All those little project. details that take forever at the end. They, I'm, it's not that bad. It's just, I just haven't had the time to get out here and do them. What's next, babe? Uh, Sean O'Neill wants to know, uh, does Matt have a favorite species of wood that he likes to mill and work with? So I got two, two answers for favorite species. One's a bad answer and one's a good answer for milling. Uh, favorite species to mill, that's a good answer, would be cherry because it's very aromatic. It smells, it just smells nice. And the wood's kind of nice too. And then my bad answer for that is something I have never cut before. And ideally something that does not grow here is my favorite thing to cut. That's my bad answer. <laughs> and then to, to work with, it's probably cherry. I, I like, it's fairly consistent and easy to work with and it ages beautifully. So we'll do that. I like cherry, apparently. Cherry feels so good with hand tools. It's just a nice wood. It, it does quite well for itself. Not like white oak. No, <laughs> that's, that's different. That's very different. <laughs> <laughs> or, or hickory. Hickory, is, I think, is like one of my least favorite woods because it has all the difficulty of white oak, but none of the beauty. <laughs> it's like an ugly white oak. It's like the ugly stepsister. <laughs> I was just thinking of like some insult in the woodworking world. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother's made of hickory. <laughs> Your father smells of elderberry. Take that back. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Uh, let's see. Richard Wright wants to know, will Matt's remodel come with a set of dining room chairs? Maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. That's... I need to make a breakfast nook, so probably it will. Uh oh. Will they come invaded. from your kits? Yes. 
Definitely. <laughs> oh, just the echo upstairs. Welcome to the kids. <laughs> well, which kit would you use? What? I don't know. That's, that's like Lindsay's decision. <laughs> Wise answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> I showed I showed Sarah the kits when I ordered these ones, and I said, "Would you want which one of these five? Would you want?" And your answer had better be number five. I for a second I was half paying attention because I was fixing something, and I thought you said which kid would he do, and I was <laughs> like, "That's Lindsay's choice," and I'm like. That's kind of cutthroat, but okay. <laughs> and then I realized you said kit. <laughs> I was like, whichever one sleeps. Makes, makes a little more night, sense. I don't know. That's usually my favorite. Um, so Woodworking with Logan wants to know, Matt, how many slabs do you have currently? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Excuse me. It's like a asking an Amish person how many kids they have. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I have uh, stacks and stacks and stacks. <laughs> now, there's a, uh, um, a question going on the Wood by Right Hive mind of how many planes do you own? And uh, it's, it's actually Not kind enough. of an interesting thing. Some people are only two and some people are like uh, four, five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> That truth or what you tell your spouse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although yours are all on display, so. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Sounds like a really good head. question to ask your audience. Uh, actually go out and count them and then do a census of who got closest. <laughs> <laughs> How many beans are in this jar? <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. Let's see. Clark42 asks, what's the toughest thing to overcome in your course of going from starting to reaching, reaching your current level? Hmm. Uh, is this for me? Yeah. Or both of us? I'll let you answer okay. that one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably like just not getting I don't know, like overwhelmed or discouraged, I guess, along the way. It's probably like the, the biggest kind of hurdle. Yeah. It's in the, in the beginning, there's like this time, like in the beginning, you got like the beginning and then you got like this like weird transition period from like, you're like, okay, I'm doing stuff cool, whatever. Then like you get to this point where you're like, oh, I can actually know what's good and what's bad with my work. And just getting over that hump of like, oh, all the stuff maybe before this was kind of crap because I didn't really have that attention to detail yet. <laughs> I didn't really, I just, I didn't, I didn't know, like it was supposed to be this good or, or whatever. And like not being discouraged by that and be like, okay, this is before this served a purpose. These pieces I made were not that good, but they're still, I'm still proud of them, but they're not up to the standards that I have now. Yeah. And you're like, okay, now I know what to look for. I, can pay more attention to those little details because I'm not worried about how my tools are set up, how to make cuts, how things are supposed to work. I'm not worried about uh, the sequence of things. That's all kind of figured out in that early period. Now you can really dive in and focus on uh, accuracy and like design and paying attention to grain and like stuff like that. So it's yeah. just that weird little moment when you're like, am I actually good at this? Do I really just suck at this? <laughs> and just kind of pushing through like yes you'll be fine keep going it's it's nice on the other side <laughs> i think for me it would end up being um listening to the audience the world and everything and learning without taking it to heart <laughs> in other words you know not not worrying about what other people do and just do what i want to do because this is what i want to do but still being able to learn from it and not shutting it out. Uh, that that balance is one that I I think was probably the hardest lesson. One that I still not learned. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Let's see. 
So this question's for Matt. Richard wants to know, are you planning to return to Iowa for more derecho wood? Uh, we're supposed to go back to the same property at, at some point. The new owner, he, so we went and picked up that one tree. That was two days before they closed on the sale of that house, of the property. And we kind of talked to the new owner after they closed and like, he's like in zero rush to clean anything up and it's probably not going to do anything. So it's kind of nice because we're like, oh, it's kind of a long way and I'm kind of busy a lot of times. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, whatever you want, just come and just, just whatever. And I'm okay, cool. <laughs> so the, I guess the short answer is yes. I'll be going back. I don't know when, but I'll, I will go back. And when does the amount of wood that you want outweighs the amount of wood that you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, well, if it's, it's going to just sit here anyway, because I don't have time to cut it anyways. So yeah. I might as well sit there until I'm ready to cut it. <laughs> Oops. Uh, interesting. Uh, what are you planning on doing with the, uh, the, the tank? With the diesel tank? Yeah. I want to use it. I'm sick of buying diesel by the five gallon, like jug thing. Just get sick of it. it. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. You had talked about doing something interesting with it earlier, and I wasn't sure if you'd. Yeah, using it. <laughs> that is, <laughs> sounds like a good idea. <laughs> what, use a tool for its intended purpose. <laughs> yeah, you know, for holding that. <laughs> <They wouldn't... laughs> What's next? All right. Um. So Clark wants to know, are arborists worth getting in touch with about salvaging the lowest eight to 10 feet of um, the tree trunk? Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a few uh, tree service and arborist connections and they're uh, good to have kind of looking out for stuff for you. The one thing about um, working with them is that you're on their time. So you can't be like, oh, I can't come today because whatever. So it's If you have a day job, it's probably not going to yeah. work out so well because they're not just going to leave this thing in someone's yard when they were paid to get rid of it. So you generally have to be there at the time that they're actually doing the removal to take it in that moment. Um, otherwise, if they have if they're a larger operation, <clears throat> excuse me, they might have an actual truck that can actually pick those things up whole and bring it wherever and they may have a um like a shop or a yard where they park all their equipment and then you can kind of get it after hours but you really have to talk to those companies and see what they're willing to do and you have to as a person getting it from them make it easy for them like their business their job is to get rid of that tree as efficiently as possible and if you're not making it efficient for them they're never going to call you back again probably <laughs> I had a friend, we were looking at uh, doing some milling here, and uh, he had contacts with several arborists, and it was pretty much all of them were, it will give you a two hour heads up, and if you can make it in this two hour window, great, you can pick them up and take them, but if you can't, they're turned into chips. Yep. Because it would That's save them time of chipping it, but if otherwise, it's just not worth it, just get them out of the yard. Mm -hmm. What's next? All right, this next question is for Matt. Alex wants to know, what is the longest slab you have cut, Matt? Uh, the longest would be like 12 and a half feet, which is what I can cut on the current um, uh, bed of the saw. Uh, that was like the longest, that's like the biggest saw I could put in my driveway at my old house. And at my old house, like 10 foot lumber was the longest I could even deal with. Like if I cut it, that was it. Longer than that, I had nowhere to actually put it. Um, so that's kind of why I built it to be that length, but now that I have more space, I can go as long as I want. So I got a five foot extension that I'm building for it. That'll take me to 17 feet. And then when I build the, the sawmill building in the back of the property years from now, I'm going to put it on a 40 foot bed. <laughs> so I can cut more than one thing at once or really, really long stuff. So I want to cut beams for my shop when I build that. That sounds like a fun one. Do you have yeah. trees on your property to harvest for it or? 
Nope. I'm gonna go find them. <laughs> you've got that trailer. I've got, I've got a few years. <laughs> and you've got the tools to move them now. Yeah. That's true, I can move whatever I want to now. Not getting it's all nice. the, uh, the comments about uh, using the PV to roll things around. <laughs> <laughs> the good old days. <laughs> I love those comments. <laughs> So this next question is for both. CP wants to know, <clears throat> what type of stones do you recommend for sharpening blades of hand planes and why? <laughs> yeah, what do you use? Uh, water stones. Any particular or just? Uh, I got one of those cheap ones from Amazon. The two-sided? Yeah, the two-sided one. I got a, a uh, what is it, an 800 and 4,000. I still haven't worn through the whole thickness yet. It's been, it's probably been like 10 years now, or maybe, maybe nine or something like that. Um, but that's, I used that for the majority of my sharpening for years. Uh, when I felt a little spendy, I added an 8,000 grit stone just to kind of, for bonus points, but it doesn't matter, whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for years I used 800 and then 4,000 and then went, went right back to work. And now I'm, I do more stropping, so I don't spend much time on the stones because I'm maintaining edges as I'm working. That's the real reason I have so many of them, is I don't sharpen them until they have to be sharpened, and I can just grab the next I've one. I've got a different one. <laughs> right now I have, I think I have one plane there that's sharp, and the rest need to be sharpened. So one of these days I'm just going to sit down and do them all. <laughs> You can do that while you're finishing your chair parts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I like diamonds just because they're, they cut a little faster. There's no mess to them. There's no flattening. You're just done. Um, the downside to them is you never get that same feeling. Waterstones just feel so good. There's something that you get them off that waterstone that just, it, it's very pleasing. Um, you can get a mirror polish on a waterstone. You can't get a mirror polish with diamonds um, because they, they cut differently. Um, but it's a efficiency as opposed to uh, um, feel. But every now and then I, I want to pull out my water stones and, and just for the experience, it's fun. And you'll get it sharp anyway, so. Whatever, whatever works. Yeah. I've got a friend who's been um, sharpening for probably about 15 years or so, and he still just uses sandpaper. It's like, how much money have you spent on sandpaper over the years? That just sounds <laughs> inconvenient. <laughs> like, I don't know, like, I know it works, but the few times I've done it, I'm like, this isn't like enjoyable either. Yeah, yeah exactly. I don't enjoy this. Like the water stone, like, oh, this is kind of nice. It's got this like smooth, slick action, like with sandpaper, like. <laughs> I'm always That's holding it down and hoping it doesn't flap up or cut through it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What's next? Mm -hmm. How many do we have left? Um, I have three questions left so far, and it's 48. Okay. So we're doing good. Cool. Um, I'm not sure if it's directed to Matt specifically, this question. Um, so, James, if you want to answer to uh, Donald... Hesselton asks, what is the most challenging joint to make for a piece of furniture? Hmm. What's the most challenging joint you've made? Waterfall. Yeah. A really, really because big miter. It takes a lot of, to do like a really good one, it just takes a lot of like yeah. little things and finessing and whatnot and like because you're trying to remove as little material as possible and you're trying to get those two miters to come together perfectly across their entire length so you don't have any gaps it's nice and seamless and the grain flows over that corner it's not difficult per se but it's just like there's Time there's a lot of like minute things that go into that now the one that's probably taken me the longest is i did a double sunrise so you have the the sunrise dovetails and there were two of them side by side on a board that was large enough for it. And it wasn't terribly complicated. It was just very tedious. 
I was, there was just so much transferring of marking that it, it took forever. <laughs> looked really cool, looked really cool, but um, I don't know if I would be the most difficult. Probably the most difficult I've ever done was actually joining up the two slabs for the dining room table. Um, that was actually lot. getting jointed two inch wide over 11 foot long so you don't see a seam anywhere along it because there's there's no flex in those you're not going to be able to clamp out the seam <laughs> no no <laughs> and you you can't you know regularly check it because you know it's a 400 pound slab you have to match and then take down and take off a little bit and match it again and <laughs> that was difficult <laughs> Stupid, but difficult. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're honest. It's done. Yeah, yeah. Still love that table. Oh, man, I love sitting at that. I was looking at it tonight and being like, oh, I like sitting here. I, lo I like this. Yeah, it's a nice table. <laughs> he does. He just rubs it every so often. <laughs> Hello, table. How are you? <laughs> it's amazing how much punishment that's taken with all three kids. At, uh... They do that. I'm glad it's oak. <laughs> Cherry would not have survived them. <laughs> no. <laughs> What's next? All right. So Clark42 wants to know, has woodworking forced you to become an electrician and a mechanic? <laughs> I don't know if like woodworking per se, as much as like just life in general. I don't know, being a homeowner. Being an adult with stuff that breaks, yes, kind of adulting does into that. See, <laughs> <laughs> so my hand tool world has actually pushed me away from being an electrician. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I'm like a lighting expert. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I've learned more about lighting and videography than anything else. <laughs> How do you set up a camera? Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, as with any project, though, there's always something, something in the in the rabbit hole that you have to learn something new. Yeah, I think that's what keeps it fun is having that new skill to learn. Because if you're not learning anything, then you're not really having any fun. You're just a factory worker. I would agree with that. All right, so I have three more questions, and I think we're gonna just do those. Cool. Um, because it's eight fifty two. So. Let's see, Zag Studios. How do you sharpen irregular curved shaped card scrapers? The same as straight ones? I would say the only trick to those is that you only sharpen the area of the curve you want to use. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a little overkill. Yeah, you're moving the burnisher straight or you're following the curve. Yeah. Otherwise, it's the same exact process. I'm trying to think if there's anything I would do differently, and it's. I think the only thing I might do differently is how I hold them, but even that's only a slight grip change or putting it on the corner of a vise so I can go around the corner rather than mm -hmm. being on top of it. But not much. Don't overthink it. I think a lot of people have that problem of overthinking things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love when I get those emails of like, I've really been trying to figure out how to make this joint and I've got this whole jig set up for it, but I don't think this jig is good enough. So I'm going to do this jig, but I'm having a problem with a particular aspect of the jig. It's like, mark a line and cut it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I did. So as a, as a funny aside story to that is I, when I mitered the curve molding for the base of this, of this piece, this thing down here, uh -huh. I was like, I was trying to jig it all up to get the angle cracked, and I'm like, why? I just I drew a line on it, and I went to my table saw with the crosscut sled, and I just held it at whatever angle it was, and just put it through the saw. Done. So it was like, it's kind of like the hand tool woodworker, like power tool hybrid approach. Yeah. Like yeah. I saw the line, I saw the line, but I used a table saw. Yeah. <laughs> All right, What's so next? Next question is for Matt. Tim Ort wants to know what is your favorite finish and why? <laughs> well, I have a can of it right here. <laughs> I don't think we can see it. 
Uh, I like uh, Armor, Armor Seal, Seal because I know how to use it, and that's the only reason I like it mm-hmm. as much as I do. Uh, it gives me it gives me a look I, I want. I, I prefer like a a finish with some sheen to it, uh, with some kind of build and a good amount of protection. But I just I've been used it, finishing is one of those things where, like you don't mess with perfection. Like once you figure something out that works really well for you, that's it. I'm done. I'm never experimenting ever again because <laughs> there's too much at risk. <laughs> I used to be Armor Seal or Minwax Poly until I tried Rubia Monocoat on the dining room table, and that uh, that changed me. Now all my furniture is Rubia Monocoat. It's just it's oh, one it's all... one finish, 15 minutes, and it's done. And uh, it, it's not, you don't get the build up look and you don't get quite as much protection. But I love that ultra matte feel of the wood grain. It feels like it's just a simple oil wipe on. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and it smells good. I, I think that's the reason why I do it is it smells fantastic. It's a finish that I just, it has a visceral, oh, delightful smell to it. Which is hilarious because you usually can't smell anything. I know. <laughs> I can I can smell that. I love opening. Which is usually a problem if you can smell. <laughs> you have a last question. I got two more actually. Oh okay. One more snuck in because it's a good one. That's it. <laughs> Alex wants to know. <laughs> Questions for both of you. What is your dovetail per hour? <laughs> <laughs> If, mm. if I'm doing it for a video, a DPH. I, I think it would be somewhere around. I mean, if I'm doing two dovetails on an end, it would be somewhere around six minutes for dovetail set. So, so you, know, you know, ten sets an hour. But if I'm doing it for myself, it's one an hour. I take the time and I really enjoy just sitting back and cutting them. I like going slow. <laughs> what about uh, you? Is that for a through dovetail or a half blind? Yes. <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, I can do. I like four usually. It, it depends how wide the, yeah. the boards are, but if it's like a drawer size, you know, four to six inches. Oh yeah, those like are four an hour, somewhere around there. Those are taking longer. Yeah. All right, so last question. Dennis Miko wants to know, how did you both talk your wives into joining your shows? <laughs> I don't know, did I ever talk you into it? I think you were like, please, will you help me on the live? And I finally acquiesced. <laughs> I just... I just told her we're doing this. <laughs> uh, come in the shop at four o'clock or whatever and read the questions. That was it. <laughs> she loves me way too much. <laughs> yeah, I think we all follow uh, uh, Mark's wife. Oh, you've never, I don't think you've ever watched I Mark. I know who Lindsay is. No, 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 Mark. Mark who? No, Spagnola. I was like, oh, Matt, Mark. Oh, my gosh. I'm getting confused. <laughs> I was like, Lindsay. Oh, no, that's <laughs> wrong. Person. Mark Spagnola. I don't know. Do I, should the I know whisper? who Mark Spagnola is? Yeah. I'm trying to remember her name, and I can't remember her name now. It's bugging me. It's Mark Spagnola. Nicole. Nicole. There you are. Is that, oh, is that a, he, he's a different name on Instagram, though, right? Wood Whisperer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Nicole, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, don't say his real name. I don't know. I know him what he is on I Instagram. Don't know. <laughs> it's really I don't sad know how things. woodworking has overtaken my Instagram. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it really has. Instagram webtoons. Anyways. Cool. Uh, well, I think we have squandered another perfectly good hour. And uh, it's been fun having you on, Matt. Thank you. Bring Thanks Lindsay next me. time. <laughs> you can invite her. That's fine. Yeah, we keep talking about doing a live sometime where I run the chat and Sarah is on with other woodworkers' wives. 
That's actually, I would watch that. <laughs> or, or having uh, Anne of all trades having her husband on. And... <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would also be good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I think this will do it. Um, thank you, Matt, for coming. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, looking forward to next time and uh, hopefully finishing your chairs sometime this century. Yeah, I'll, I'll believe when I see it. <laughs> yes. Cool. On that note, have a wonderful day. Bye. Goodbye. Cool. Right. Thanks, Matt.